and there are still a lot of questions that I and a lot of other people would like to see answered, namely, how did Ipe have access to these bank accounts? And then of course, this story drops. So Ken, I know you did fair territory leading up to the press conference. What were your thoughts on how this all went down last night? Certainly, it was interesting to hear him be so upfront and take a head-on approach to what is going on. Now, there was never going to be a question and answer session, not when you've got a federal investigation going on, an MLB investigation going on. I thought initially when I heard he was going to talk, we were going to get very little, and we got a lot more than that. We basically got his explanation. Now, we did not get every answer. And there are still a lot of questions that I and a lot of other people would like to see answered, namely, how did Ipe have access to these bank accounts? How was he making these payments without Shohei knowing about them? These are all reasonable questions that in due time, I am hoping that we get answers to. But I heard what you guys were saying, and I generally agree. For what that was, that was about as good as it could have been. Now, is it the truth? It's hard to know with 100% certainty that it's the truth or 75% of the truth or 50% of the truth. But the one thing I said on my show yesterday and the one thing that makes some sense to me is that if you're going after someone and you're accusing them of massive theft, if your lawyers are going to the authorities with that, you're leaving yourself open too. And if a person generally who has done bad things is not going to take that approach. So... Because he has been so aggressive in pointing out, in his view, what Ipe has done, it would seem to me that that would lean in his favor. That reinforces what he is saying. You could make the case he still could be lying and this all could be a bunch of nothing, but I don't know. It's, it's hard to know exactly, but certainly the story that they're presenting is plausible. And that is all we have to go on right now. I would imagine in time, through the federal investigation in particular, more will be known about just how this worked and how it went down, how Ipe was sending that money to the bookie without Shohei's knowledge, if that is indeed what was happening. But right now, that is the lingering thing for me, just how this all could take place, how millions of dollars could transfer without Shohei Otani's knowledge. Ken, uh, I hear you need a translator for Fox, so give me access to your bank accounts with all the money you make, and I will be happy to do it for you. <laughs> well, I will say this, that people in powerful positions with a lot of money, they do dole out responsibilities to others. We've seen this in entertainment where entertainers get scammed. We've seen it with athletes, where athletes get violated their they have their trust violated by people that are close to them that is not out of the realm the amount of money here and the way this went down and just all of the things that supposedly happened again i i just would like to hear more okay ken how i mean that wasn't my question but of course you had an answer so uh what <laughs> how, how long do we think this will go on like how long could this drag on and do you think at some point it could become a distraction for not only otani but his teammates and the Dodgers organization. I don't know, AJ, how long this investigation will take. And if you ask the federal government, the investigators, if we had them on the air right now, which we wouldn't because they're federal investigators, but if you ask them, they probably would say, we don't know. We have to just do our process and go through what we go through. Could it become a distraction? I would say it would become a distraction only if more comes out. As the season begins, as we get rolling here and we're in the same place. I can't imagine it being too much of a distraction. But there are going to be things that are leveled on social media that are going to come up. They've already been things on social media we've seen accusing him of this and that and the other thing. And that's the world we live in today. If any of those gather steam, if there's any validity to any of them, then maybe it becomes a distraction. But I would expect that the noise will diminish as these investigations continue, as long as nothing else comes out. Distractions to other players. Is there any inclination or like where investigators have to like interview the other players, like interview Mookie Betts in his time, interview Mike Trout with his time with Ipe, interview, like are there, do the investigators have to interview 
current players who are active because the season's starting and any kind of extra interview is a distraction. You're asking me how a federal investigation works, Eric, and <laughs> I can't say I know the answer to that. Is it possible that those people, the Angels in particular, would be interviewed? Yeah. I guess. But if I'm Mike Trout and a federal investigator wants to talk to me for two hours about it on even a game day, it's only so much of a distraction. I, I can't see that being an issue if it comes up at all. Yeah. Uh, Ken, let's go to the youngsters that are making ball clubs. Well, one that does and one that doesn't. But let's start with the positives. You wrote about Wyatt Langford. Can you give us more context on what you're learning about him and how special the defending champs could be with a potential rookie of the year coming through? It's amazing. They actually have two potential rookies of the year because Evan Carter is still a rookie. Remember, he just came up last September. Of course, he played in the playoffs, but he technically is still a rookie. But Wyatt Langford, number four pick in last year's draft out of the University of Florida, hit at Florida like crazy, hit in the minors like crazy, hit in the spring like crazy. And he not only has all of that, because numbers are numbers, and listen, we all know at the highest level, all players get exposed. But he has a demeanor about him, a way about him, as does Carter for that matter, that is professional, it's mature, and has really impressed the Rangers all spring and even going back to the taxi squad last postseason. So here's a kid who is going to be in their opening day lineup, the defending World Series champions opening day lineup. He, I expect, will be somewhere in the middle of the order, three through six in that range, and they have that kind of faith in him. Chris Young, their general manager, has said, people ask me, do we think about sending him down? He didn't give us an opportunity to think about sending him down. So that's how much of an impression he has made on them. And he really seems to be, from an offensive standpoint, an extremely special talent. Defensively, not as strong. He's going to DH quite a bit, I would expect. In the outfield, he's just okay, it seems. But it's going to be exciting to watch him play because the thing that he has at the plate is this calm, see the field kind of thing. And he, his pitch recognition from what Tim Hires, the hitting coach, says is off the charts. Tim Hires had Mookie Betts in Boston. Mookie Betts is his all-time guy in pitch recognition. And he said that Langford is basically close to that class. So we'll see how it all plays out, but I do not expect this kid to fail. He might struggle early on. He might have to get sent to the minors like Mike Trout did after a month. But it seems to me that the Rangers got a good one here. Is there a chance that they could steal Rookie of the Year votes? You see it happen with MVP from each other. And as a you know somebody who's voting for that, is that something that – goes into your thought like ah you know what i can't i can't figure out you know if if langford was as good as he should have been or carter was there because of that do you see that as a possibility for people who are trying to pick who the rookie of the year is going to be i don't see it as a problem eric because if you're voting right you're not going to penalize one because of the other i believe the rookie of the year you vote for three so there are three places on the ballot, and if Carter and Langford are 1-2 or Langford and Carter are 1-2, you'll place them accordingly. I guess there are voters, and I don't want to speak for all voters, and I can't account for the voting patterns of all of our members, but I guess there are some who might say, I'm only voting for one Ranger, but that's kind of dumb, and <laughs> I just don't see that happening. <laughs> The writers would never do anything dumb, right, Ken? Well, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, the Langford story is, is amazing to me because he was a, basically a non-important player in University of Florida his freshman year. I think he got two at-bats. He was the bullpen catcher. He stuck it out, didn't transfer, went in the weight room, got his body in shape, became an outfielder, obviously hit a sophomore year, and then his junior year he went off, became the number four overall pick. But you mentioned Carter and Langford. You also talked about another guy that was supposed to be in the rookie of the year voting in Jackson Holiday, and he's going to Norfolk in AAA. So how does this affect the Orioles? And I, I'm sorry, I, I will admit this. I did not hear what you said about it. So I want to hear why in the heck didn't this guy make the team? Because you said the Rangers never were given an opportunity to send Langford down. Well, Jackson Holiday raked in spring training too and seemed like it would be a great fit. So why did they make that decision? AJ, you make a great point there. And 
I will go back to something you guys experienced as players, if not yourselves, certainly seeing it with teammates. Teams generally make the decisions that provide the least amount of resistance. Now you can say, well, whoa, Jackson Holiday sending him down is a good amount of resistance. Why would you even do that? He hit 300 in the spring at a 900 OPS. But there are other considerations in play. And don't take this as me justifying this move. I'm just going to try to explain what their thinking might have been. They've got two infielders, Mateo and Urias, who are out of options. And they don't want to risk sending one of them to the minors and losing them when they represent valuable depth. Jackson Holiday is 20 years old. He's played only a little bit above AA. I believe it's 14 games at AAA, something along those lines. He is someone who they feel needs to improve, perhaps, against the advanced left-handed pitching he'll see as a left-handed hitter. He is someone learning a new position. He's 20 years old. All of these reasons are legitimate reasons. The problem is that the general manager, Mike Elias, said as far back as December, hey, this guy's got a really good shot. Well, if he's got a really good shot and he does nothing wrong, then what is the issue? And I think the issue is some of these roster considerations. They don't want to bring Holiday up and not play him. It seems like it's all of that. But at the same time, I know what Scott said and has been very critical. I know some friends of mine in Baltimore, actually one in the media, who is disgusted with this decision. He's absolutely upset with it. And I get that too, because if the goal is to put your best team on the field, put your best team on the field. Let's go. And I know service time has been raised as a possibility. And Jackson Holiday is represented by Scott Boris. You can get an extra year if you keep him in the minor leagues, an extra year of control for a certain amount of time. But under the current CBA, the new one, if you finish 1-2 in Rookie of the Year, it doesn't matter when you came up, you get a full year of service. This happened with Tanner Bybee last year of the Guardians. He came up, I believe, in May. I'm not exactly sure. Don't hold me to that. He did not open the season, put it that way. And yet he finished second in the Rookie of the Year and got a full year of service. So... The idea of playing service time games at this point is pretty obsolete. It just seems that all of these other considerations were in play. I'm not sure I agree with this decision, but I do understand where they were coming from. Do you think that the new rules that they did put in place suffice any service manipulation? Because I went on a radio station in Baltimore this morning, defending the same thing I said on foul territory yesterday, and Scott and I had an argument about it, that I think the rules are fair. And, and service time manipulation, I get it. You get an extra year out of him, possibly, if he's not one or two. But the best team on the field is not the best 26 to start the season. It's the best team on the field for 48 to 55 guys for the entire season. So do you feel like the changes that they made in the CBA are valuable or are working correctly in a situation like this? Because he's not Chris Bryant or Wyatt Langford coming out of a college. They've helped. And the rules are never going to be perfect. When you have pay dictated by service, you're always going to have the possibility of manipulation. No matter what rules you put in, no matter what system you put in, there's always going to be that specter hanging over it. But I do believe because of the example I just cited and also the other idea when you start the season with a rookie on the opening day roster and he wins rookie of the year, you get the extra draft pick. This happened with the Orioles last year in Gunnar Henderson. So they've proven that they will do this. They just for the reasons that I stated and maybe some others, I don't know, did not want to do that with Jackson Holiday. And the other thing I'll say here, and again, I'm hesitant because I know it's going to come off sounding like an apologist for the Orioles, but in this particular case, it's the opening day roster. I get it. He's going to be with the team for most of the season. And we make too much of the opening day roster and who's on it because the rosters, as we know, change so dramatically over the course of the season. You could argue fairly that this does not send the right message that this kid earned it and man, play your best players. Just don't worry about anything else. Play your best players. But there are always these other considerations, who you might lose, all those kinds of things. And we'll see how it plays out. I would say this, that Elias, because of the way they handled Gunnar Henderson last year, 
because of their success with developing Adley Rushman. He deserves the benefit of the doubt here, even if we disagree with his decision. They've done a pretty darn good job of developing talent, and they also sent back to the minor leagues some other really good players, Mayo and Kierstad. Now, known as Jackson Holiday, but these guys could end up being stars in the major leagues, but the Orioles' roster is so crowded right now that it just makes it difficult. Hey, I've got one more on the Orioles on a different note because we're going to talk about this story right after we let you go here. Do you think that the new ownership group will try and make some type of splash when they come in? It sounds like they are going to get the approval tomorrow, the day before opening day. So I'm wondering if an extension gets worked on for one of the young stars like Rutschman or Gunnar Henderson. Jordan Montgomery is still out there. We've seen ownership groups do this. I know it's weird timing, but you could throw some money out there and show the city that you're going to be different. What do you say? It's a good question, Scott. Now, they have 40% of the team coming in. They had the right to purchase the rest, this new group, upon the death of Peter Angelos, which of course occurred last weekend. I don't know and I would not expect that that transaction has taken place yet. So the question I would have is, if you've got 40% now, do you have the authority and the power to go ahead and sign Jordan Montgomery? Let's put that one out there. That's the obvious one right now. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know their inclination. I don't know what Mike Elias would say, but it wouldn't cost him a draft pick. He did not receive a qualifying offer because he was traded in the middle of a season. And that would be step one. That would be the first thing you could do to really shore up your team. But I just don't know where they stand as far as how much control they're going to have right away and how that plays out in the future. Okay, fair. I know some Baltimore fans are like, here we go. <laughs> things are about to change. Open well, up things the are about to change. No, there's no yeah. question about that. Things are going to change, and it would seem for the better. But mm -hmm. will they change immediately? That's what you're asking, and I don't know the answer to that. Yes, fair. Well, Ken, thank you very much. Appreciate the time. We'll catch you later this oh, week. Hold on, Ken. What? What? Dude, you, you don't pay attention. Yo, I'm doing 90 things. Dude, we'll Just pay attention. No. Me. Next time oh, I man. will punch you. Um, Ken, I know you spent a lot of time in Baltimore. We're talking about Baltimore. I'm assuming you saw what happened in Baltimore last night. Um, I know you probably went over that bridge a few times. So I just wanted to say, I know we didn't hit on it yet, but like praying for the people and all that happened that last night and the people that are still missing and all that. And I know you're a Baltimore guy. So while you're on, I figured you might have a thought or two about that. AJ, I was absolutely shocked when I saw that this morning. And that bridge is a staple in Baltimore, like any bridge in any city. And to have something like that happen is just heartbreaking. And let's just hope they find enough people and people are okay. But that was just a shocking, shocking thing. And I'm sure the whole city is just waking up this morning or experiencing their day and kind of numb because it was awful. And I don't know that there's much more I can add than that. It was just an unbelievable thing to see. Yeah, Ken, thank you. Yeah, thinking about everyone um, in Baltimore that, that's affected by the terrible tragedy that's going on out there right now. Ken, we will grab you later this week, all right? Thanks, guys. Thank you. And, of course, fair territory is not just once, but twice every single week. So, Ken's latest came on Monday talking about the union tumultuous situation that has been going down there, the Mets and J.D. Martinez, um, and many other topics. Obviously, Grill and Ken, if you have questions for Ken. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball, the way it should be covered.